Hey, what's up you guys? Thanks for joining me. As you know from the title, we're going to be discussing the bizarre disappearance of Angela Hammond. Angela went missing from Clinton, Missouri on April 4th, 1991, while she was speaking with her boyfriend at a phone booth. Her disappearance could possibly be linked to a few other cases that we'll be discussing later in this video, though I'm not sure how likely that is. Angela was 20 years old and pregnant at the time of her disappearance, and she is still missing over 28 years later. All right, let's jump right in. Angela Marie Hammond was born on February 9th, 1971 to her parents, Marcia and Chris Hammond. She was born in Kansas City, but her family moved to Clinton, Missouri to be closer to her maternal grandparents when Angela was only four years old. A year later, Marcia and Chris welcomed a son named Lauren into the world, but their marriage fell apart shortly after. Despite their differences, both Marcia and Chris remained very involved in their children's lives and they all remained tight knit. Angela grew up and attended high school in Clinton and she had grown accustomed to the small town lifestyle that Clinton had provided. She and her best friend Kyla remained close all throughout high school and they grew close enough to consider each other to be like sisters. People describe Angela as smart and funny. She had the ability to remain upbeat and happy in almost any circumstance. People were drawn to her because there was never a dull moment when she was around. Angela was responsible. By 19, she was not only attending college at Central Missouri State University, but she was also working as an overnight processor at Union State Bank in Clinton. Angela would soon need to mature even faster because in November of 1990, she met a man named Rob Schaefer and the two became serious almost immediately. By January of 1991, Angela discovered that she was expecting her first child and that news obviously changed the course of both of their lives. Rob, being a year younger than Angela, was still a senior in high school and was known around town as a football star. That didn't stop them from being completely over the moon about their new baby. And Rob proposed to Angela shortly after they received the news. She gladly accepted his proposal and the two began planning their future together. Angela was going to continue going to school and Rob planned to enlist in the military to support their new family. However, those plans would come to a complete halt on April 4th, 1991, when Angela suddenly vanished from a Clinton store parking lot as she was speaking to Rob on the payphone. It was unusually warm that day and people were hosting an array of barbecues and celebrating spring. Marsha, Angela's mom, decided to have one as well. She invited all of their friends and family and of course Rob. Angela and Rob had a great time socializing and eating food, but they had to cut the evening short at around 9 p.m. due to Rob promising his mother that he would babysit his younger brother. Rob and Angela left the barbecue together and made plans to meet up a few hours later once his mom returned. Angela dropped him off at home and then made her way to pick up Kyla so that the two could have a little girl time together. They had made plans to spend time together, but there wasn't a lot to do in a small town like Clinton on a Thursday anyway. So the two simply cruised around town, listening to music and chit-chatting for nearly two hours. Angela then dropped Kyla off around 11.15 p.m. And at that point, she decided that she was too exhausted to do anything else that evening and simply wanted to go home, take a bath and relax. Because she did not have a home phone, and obviously cell phones were not around in that time, she stopped by a payphone at the corner of South 2nd Street. Angela parked at the food bar and grocery store, got out of her car, and went to call Rob. She told him it had been a really long day and that she wasn't up to seeing him that night. But one thing led to another, and they ended up staying on the phone for nearly 30 minutes. Around 11.45 p.m., Angela told Rob something that was a little unsettling for both of them. She said that she noticed a man that had been circling the block a few times, and it was kind of sketching her out. So much so that she described the man to Rob, as well as his truck, just in case anything happened. The man was driving a green Ford F-150 pickup truck, and looks like a filthy bearded man, as Angela put it. 
Rob remained on the phone with her, but the situation became even more creepy when the man actually pulled over and then exited his truck. He then walked over to the unoccupied phone booth that was beside her. Once he approached the phone, he quickly turned around and returned to his vehicle, where he then pulled out a flashlight and began looking for something on the ground. Angela was describing all of this to Rob as it was happening, but she gave the man the benefit of the doubt and tried to be friendly. She asked him if he needed to use the phone that she was on. Rob heard the man say no, and then heard Angela scream immediately afterwards. Obviously, at that point, he was completely shook and immediately went to try and help Angela, leaving his little brother home alone. Rob was about seven blocks away from where Angela was, and while heading to the phone booth, he spotted a truck that Angela described going in the opposite direction. Rob claims he was able to see her struggling with a man as he was driving and then heard Angela scream his name. He says he threw his car in reverse and quickly made a U-turn, attempting to chase down the truck for about two miles. Rob was gaining traction, but suddenly his transmission failed during a right turn and the car died right in the middle of the road. Obviously at that time, the truck was able to get away and Rob sadly had no choice but to try and get back in town as soon as possible. He began hitchhiking toward the police station, and thankfully, someone was nice enough to pick him up and drive him there. Rob arrived at the station just before midnight. So this abduction and car chase happened all within about 15 minutes, but the police were not able to locate Angela, the man, or the truck anywhere. Rob told detectives that the man was wearing coveralls, a dark baseball cap, glasses, and had a full beard and mustache, which they ultimately created a composite sketch with. He also told them that the truck was from the 60s or 70s. It had a white top and a large decal on the back window that showed a fish jumping out of the water. The police initially believed that Rob was lying. Again, Clinton was a small town where things like abductions and high-speed chases simply do not happen. The detectives believed that the story was staged and that it was really Rob that attacked Angela. They stuck with that notion for the first week after Angela disappeared. Despite them finding Rob's car in the middle of the street and Angela's car abandoned in the parking lot, exactly where Rob said she went missing from. Her purse was inside the vehicle, undisturbed. Rob was eventually cleared as a suspect when two witnesses came forward, stating that they had seen a man driving around town in the same truck that Rob had described and he also passed a polygraph test. Police still had no leads, and the town was in complete shock and utter panic. Angela's parents were obviously devastated, and police needed to come up with some answers and fast. They then turned their attention to Angela's ex-boyfriend, a man named Bill Barker. They had split up just before Angela began dating Rob, and it was actually rumored around town that Angela was pregnant with Bill's child and not Rob's. Bill denied this, and the rumors were completely unsubstantiated. Bill was cleared of any wrongdoing a short time later. The community of Clinton really came together for Angela and her family. They had hundreds of people putting up missing persons flyers, and they completed multiple air and ground searches, looking for any evidence that Angela had been there. They searched in creeks, dried up wells, and fields, and despite their best efforts, the searches turned up nothing. As far as the truck description goes, over 1,600 vehicles in the state of Missouri matched, but again, it led nowhere. After a short time, detectives began to suspect that Angela's disappearance could possibly be linked to two other cases that had occurred less than 80 miles away. Both of them happened within the last four months, one in January and one in February. The first victim was Trudy Darby a 42-year-old woman that lived and worked in Max Creek, Missouri. She was working the night shift at a convenience store called K&D on the night of her disappearance. Trudy was about to close the store up around 10 p.m. when she noticed there were three young men hanging around the parking lot outside of the store. She was obviously uneasy about their presence and decided that she should call her teenage son to come down there while she closed up. Her son arrived within 10 minutes of her phone call, but Trudy was nowhere to be found. Unfortunately, police discovered her body in a field 15 miles away in Little Niagara Falls, Missouri, only two days later. 
she was nude and had been shot two times with a 38 caliber. The second victim was 30 year old Cheryl Ann Kenny, who is a wife and mother living in Nevada, Missouri. Like Trudy, Cheryl was also working the night shift at a convenience store called the Quality Convenience Store. She was scheduled to be working until midnight. However, business was slow and she made the decision to close up early. She told the janitor that he could leave at 10 p.m., at which time she closed up her register and finished a few things around the store. She clocked out around 10.17 because she had to wait for a customer to leave. At that time, she set the alarm and exited the store to get to her vehicle that was in the parking lot. Somewhere between the store and her vehicle, trouble was waiting. And unfortunately, she never made it there. Cheryl vanished and exactly what happened to her remains unclear. She's still missing to this day. Trudy's murder was eventually solved three years later when a teenager named Jesse Rush and his brother Marvin Cheney bragged to their friends about getting away with her murder. The friends obviously turned them in and they eventually confessed to planning her abduction, robbing her at gunpoint, and ultimately murdering her. While in prison, Jesse Rush wrote a letter to another inmate stating that he was glad that the cops didn't know about everything else that he did or that he would be on death row elaborating saying that the police didn't know about the other women, just Trudy. So clearly they could be linked to other crimes in the area that we still don't know about because Jesse Rush has since died in prison. Getting back to Angela's disappearance, everyone's life eventually had to carry on without her. Days turned into weeks, weeks turned into months, and Rob had to proceed with his military training as planned. He ended up being sent to Virginia for training, but has always hoped that Angela and their baby would be found. Six months after Angela disappeared, in October of 1991, a new lead came to light and police hoped this would be their big break. A Canadian man living in Selkirk, Manitoba, named Russell Smith, came to Missouri to visit his family and recognized Angela from her missing persons flyer. About a month prior, he believes he saw her getting inside of a green pickup truck as she and a man were leaving a drugstore in Selkirk. The Clinton Police Department believed Russell to be a reliable witness, and they believed his story. They contacted the Royal Canadian Mountain Police and asked them to start working the case as well. By this point, Angela would have given birth to her baby, so the Canadian police began visiting hospitals as well as baby stores in the area in hopes that someone would recognize her. However, no one remembered her and they found no evidence that she was actually ever in Canada. The Clinton Police Department did eventually rule out Jesse Rush, but unfortunately not much else has happened in the case in quite some time. In April of 2009, 18 years after Angela went missing, the Clinton Police Department made a statement to the media and said that because of advancements in DNA technology, they have new evidence in her case. However, they would not elaborate on what evidence they had specifically. Since 2009, there have been no new updates in this case. Angela's family obviously still has hope to find the answers as to what happened, and Rob eventually had to move on despite never really having closure, and now he has a family of his own. All right, let's talk theories. There aren't a lot in this case. I think some people in the true crime world still find Rob's story to be suspicious. We all know now that police look at the boyfriend or the husband first, and Rob's story does sound far-fetched and maybe a little suspect. Obviously, when this happened, the man could easily hear what Angela was saying to Rob, yet she chose to describe what he looked like as well as his truck to Rob anyway. Not to mention, once this man allegedly snatched Angela, Rob says that he immediately left the house to go find her, leaving his little brother home alone and failing to call the police first. I understand going into shock and not responding in a sensible way, but calling the police immediately so they could go there as well seems obvious to me. I also have a hard time believing that Rob was able to see Angela in the truck that night. It was nighttime, Rob was panicking, and the driver would have obviously had their headlights on. Maybe it's just me, but it's really difficult to see inside someone's vehicle when they have headlights shining right in your face. 
I also find it hard to believe that Rob was able to hear Angela scream his name over the sound of a large older truck, and the suspect would most likely have the windows rolled up to avoid having anyone hear Angela scream. Phone and credit card records show that Angela did call Rob when he said she did, and we know that it was her because she used her credit card to make the call. We know that Rob's transmission did fail because police found his car in the middle of the road like he said it would be. Their phone call ended at approximately 11.45 and Rob reported her missing by midnight. That only gives him approximately 15 minutes to abduct Angela, stage his car failing, and get back to the police station, which in my opinion does not give him enough time to make this happen, and then get away with it for over 28 years. Their fast-moving relationship and the rumors about Bill being Angela's baby daddy are not enough to convince me that he's guilty in this case. The only thing that he's probably guilty of is embellishing his story just a little bit. Even if that wasn't his intention, I'm sure it felt that dramatic to him at the time. Not only that, but Angela's family has remained adamant about Rob's innocence over the years, and they still consider him to be family. Another common belief is that someone spotted an opportunity when they saw Angela at the phone booth, alone, late at night, and simply preyed upon her. I find this theory to be the most likely, but I believe she may not be this person's only victim. While I was researching this case, I found one Reddit user's theory, which I'll link in the description. They theorized that Angela's case could be linked to the murder of Elaine Nix, which is another case I plan to cover more in depth in the future. Elaine was an 18-year-old girl living in Gainesville, Georgia, who disappeared in an eerily similar manner eight years after Angela disappeared. Around 11 p.m. on September 20th, 1999, Elaine left her house and made her way to a payphone that was located at a restaurant near her home called Zach's Food Rack. She wanted to call her boyfriend that lived approximately 40 minutes away after her mother had blocked long distance calling on their home phone. She never came home that night, but her parents were not alarmed because she was 18 and would frequently spend the night with her friends or boyfriend. That night at approximately 2 a.m., police noticed Elaine's car still sitting in the parking lot with its window rolled down and the key in the ignition, but no one was around. The officer did not think much of it at the time and went on with a shift. Elaine never showed up to work and her parents decided to go search for her, only to discover that her car was abandoned at Zach's food rack. They initially believed that she was maybe out of gas or having some car trouble, but the vehicle started up no problem. And they were alarmed when they noticed that her purse and cigarettes were still in the passenger seat, which are two things she would not leave without. The police made the family wait two days to file a report, but they continued to treat Elaine's case as a runaway case. Nine days later, Elaine's remains were discovered 17 miles away from where she had last spoke with her boyfriend. Her body was severely decomposed and her cause of death could not be determined. Though the general consensus is that she was either strangled or smothered. Something to note about Elaine's case is that where she was abducted from and where her remains were discovered were conveniently located near I-95. So it is possible that whoever did this to her was traveling. Her case still remains unsolved to this day. Angela and Elaine's disappearances occurred 12 hours apart from each other, and there's about eight years in between the abductions, but the circumstances are very similar. I think it's very possible that these two cases could be linked, and I'm gonna dig more into this to see if there's more cases of women disappearing from phone booths. Another possible theory is that Angela could have been taken and put into sex trafficking, which could validate Russell Smith's story that he saw her with a man in Canada. What do you guys think happened to Angela? Do you think she could be alive out there somewhere? Or do you think that Angela and Elaine's cases are linked? Let me know in the comments. If you guys want me to cover the Trudy Darby, Cheryl Ann Kenny, or Elaine Nick's case in more detail, give me a thumbs up or leave a comment down below and I'll definitely take a look into them further. But that's all I got for you today, guys. Thank you for listening. And as always, remember the name Casey Shane. I'm out. Oh,